Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the weekly space news recap on this channel. Today, we have a bunch of new Starship updates to discuss, triple whammy Falcon 9 launches, a Russian Proton M launch, the final Boeing 747 takes to the skies, the crew six members prepare for launch at SpaceX's headquarters, new amazing views of the Artemis 1 launch were released, the Vulcan continues to rise, and much, much more. Let's kick things off, as we usually do, with Starship updates. Things have been a little bit quieter down at Boca Chica following the full stack wet dress rehearsal that we saw a few weeks ago now, which I guess is to be expected. This was a monumental milestone test for Starship. The next big milestone test will be a 33 engine static fire from Booster 7. But right now, it's not really too clear when this will be. Numerous Raptor engines have been swapped out from this booster ever since it was installed on the orbital launch mount. Three, to be precise. The latest engine swap out took place as recently as last Thursday, with the removal of Raptor engine number 42. The upper stage for the orbital flight test is still expected to be Ship 24, but of course, this was recently destacked and moved to the rocket garden. Now, we're pretty confident that it's in the proverbial scrap area, not because it's being retired, but because there really isn't any major work that would require moving it to the high bay or the mega bay. After all, the only remaining box left to tick with Ship 24 was the removal of the crane lift points and covering the leftover holes with heat shield tiling on the forward side, which workers managed to do from the deck of a cherry picker from Monday last week, captured here on Lab Padre's stream. Speaking of heat shield tiles, the late Ship 22 continues to undergo scrapping. Here's a time lapse of the removal of the thermal protection tiles on one of its tank sections. Sad, but at the same time, it's pretty satisfying footage to watch if you ask me, you know? <laughs> now, SpaceX have been having some issues with the concrete under the orbital launch pad. After the larger scale static fires from Booster 7, the concrete has needed to be extensively replaced or repaired, which of course is hardly a good thing when SpaceX are aiming for rapid reusability of Starship and Stage 0. SpaceX really have three options here. Option one is to continue trying to reinforce and develop a blast resistant concrete that can stand up to the Starship, which at this point is looking increasingly impossible. There's option two, which is to dig a big trench underneath the launch pad, like what Roscosmos do with Soyuz, or option three, use a water deluge system. Now option two, the diggy diggy hole method, isn't exactly an option for Starship as the launch pad is basically at sea level. Everything underneath the launch pad is below the water table, so a trench would require continual pumping and really it's just not feasible. This is also the reason that the launch pads at the Kennedy Space Center are built up like this. It's so that flame trenches can be present without needing to dig below the water table. So this leaves SpaceX really with only option three, a water deluge system. A water deluge system basically uses a, get ready for this, a deluge of water <laughs> to dampen the massive vibrations and force of the rocket launch. A great recent demonstration of a water deluge system is the Artemis 1 launch. Right before the massive SLS rocket took to the skies, we saw a bunch of water being thrown across the pad. And this video here shows the entire system undergoing testing. This should hopefully give you an idea of the scale of this thing. It looks like the Starbase Texas water deluge system is finally undergoing imminent construction. Water deluge equipment was seen being trucked in on Friday, and we also saw the arrival of a barge carrying water deluge pipes and tanks. Not wanting to waste any time, SpaceX got to work unloading the barge and bringing the equipment to the launch pad, and we've already started seeing sections of the water manifold being lifted into place. It's unclear if the deluge system will be ready for either the 33 engine static fire test or the orbital launch attempt, given that Elon recently stated that the orbital flight could be as early as March. Over in the high bay, Ship 26 still stands proud. We're still not quite sure what this vehicle will be used for. One theory was that this would be an expendable Starship prototype that would allow SpaceX to begin launching Starlink V2 satellites before they've perfected the reusable Starship upper stage. But now we're really not sure. However, the possibility of an expendable Starship was confirmed last week by SpaceX themselves. They updated their website Starship page. It still confirms that Starship can carry an insane 150 tons to low Earth orbit, but they have now added that it can carry 250 tons to space in an expendable mode. Starship fans were quick to notice this, and it started making the rounds on Twitter, at which point Chief Twit himself, Elon Musk, weighed in on a post by Everyday Astronaut to say that an expendable Starship upper stage may or may not fly, but it is an option. 
One question that springs to mind is what kind of payload would warrant an expendable Starship launch? 250 tons is a lot. That's the weight of the world's biggest aircraft, the Strato launch. Friend of this channel, Marcus House, also pointed out that the International Space Station weighs in at around 420 tons, meaning that, ignoring the payload's volume of course, an expendable Starship could carry the entire International Space Station into space in just two launches. What sort of payload do you think would warrant an expendable Starship? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, if you are enjoying this video so far, then don't forget to drop a like as well. It really helps me to keep my head above water in the whole algorithm these days, so I really do appreciate it. Now, we had a frenzy of Falcon 9 launches last week. Three of them, in fact. I'll go over them chronologically. The first launch was on Tuesday. This was a really great launch for two reasons. This was the 200th Falcon 9 launch for SpaceX, and the mission was a Starlink mission with a twist. The Falcon 9 carried slightly fewer Starlinks than normal in order to make room for an extra passenger. Also on board for the ride was the Italian Ion satellite carrier Electric Eleanor which itself was carrying four hosted payloads. One of them was a satellite simulator designed to help test a separation system from American firm EBAD. Another was a satellite from New Zealand-based company Stardust ME, who offer customers the chance to send the cremated ashes of loved ones into space. Another was the German Adio N3 space-breaking sail prototype. And the fourth and final one was an onboard computer prototype from a Swiss university. As for the Falcon 9 first stage itself, this was Booster 1071's seventh overall flight and during this mission it successfully touched down on the drone ship of course i still love you the second falcon 9 launch we saw last week was on thursday and was another starlink mission this one was a little bit more vanilla in the sense that it had no extra payloads in addition to the 53 starlink satellites the rocket took off from launch complex 39a at the kennedy space center Naturally, this might not be quite as vanilla as I made out. It's believed that this mission is a test flight of new hardware, involving some new technologies from the Internet of Things company Swarm, which was recently acquired by SpaceX. Despite this mission being called Starlink Group 53, these satellites weren't actually placed into the previously filled Starlink Shell 5, and instead were placed into a lower altitude 43 degree orbit. The Falcon 9 first stage for this mission was Booster 1069, and this was its fifth overall mission. It'll hopefully see many more flights to come, as shortly after launch, it successfully touched down on the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas. The third and final Falcon 9 launch we saw last week took place on Sunday from the Kennedy Space Center at Launch Complex 40. Actually, this is a bit tricky for me to talk about, as it takes place in between the time this video goes live to patrons and channel members, and when it goes live to everyone else, so I can't really say for certain if it launched. Being the optimist I am, let's just assume that it went well, and I'll put a pinned comment below to let you know if this turned out to be wrong. Of course, I've got to use footage from a different launch, so just use your imagination for this one. This time, the Falcon 9 carried just the one satellite, the Spanish communication satellite Amazonas Nexus. This was placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit, where, once operational, it'll replace the Amazonas 2. The satellite is operated by Hispasat, who operate a number of Spanish communication satellites, and they've stated that the Nexus will deliver high-capacity mobile services to the air and maritime transport sectors, among others, and this new satellite features a new generation digital transparent processor. The Nexus will have coverage over the whole of the American continent, the Atlantic corridors north and south, and Greenland. The countdown to Vulcan continues. United Launch Alliance's new flagship rocket started going vertical at the Kennedy Space Center following the arrival of its core stage, and last week on Monday, Tori Bruno shared another time lapse, this time the arrival of the 5.7 meter interstage fairing. For Americans watching, this is 1 16th the height of the Statue of Liberty. Wow, <laughs> and here's a Tory Bruno for scale. The final orbital launch that we saw last week also took place on Sunday, this time from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The rocket was a Proton M, which carried a single Electro L4 satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. According to Roscosmos, the satellite will be used for meteorological research. The Boeing 747 is a legendary aircraft, I think you'll all agree. I think it's relevant to discuss this here as it has played a big role in spaceflight over the years, I think most notably serving as the carrier aircraft for the space shuttle. Seeing this pair flying like this must have been such an amazing sight to see. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the aircraft has now been officially retired for good by Boeing, the last ever 747 has been built and sold now, and Boeing tweeted on Wednesday that she took to the skies to join Atlas Air Worldwide's fleet, serving as a cargo aircraft. 
Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley will be legends among this show's audience, and in space flight as a whole, I suppose. <laughs> in case you don't know who these two are, they're the astronauts who piloted the first ever SpaceX Crew Dragon mission, on NASA's SpaceX Demo 2 mission to the International Space Station in 2020. And on Tuesday last week, they were both awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor by Vice President Kamala Harris during a ceremony in the Indian Treaty Room of the Eisenhower Executive Office Building in Washington. A much-deserved medal, I think we can all agree. Big congratulations to Bob and Doug. While talking about NASA activities, let's go back to Artemis 1. This seems to be the launch that just keeps on giving. NASA has released yet more footage showing new views of this historic mission. I don't think I really need to say very much for you to appreciate their majesty. I think they do a pretty spectacular job speaking for themselves. I especially love this onboard shot of the SRBs detaching from the core stage in much higher resolution to what we've previously seen. And I also love these new shots showing the rocket from the perspective of the launch tower. Keep these clips coming in NASA if there still are some left to release. I, and I'm sure everyone else, just can't get enough of it. Over at SpaceX's headquarters, the crew of the upcoming SpaceX Crew-6 mission were photographed on Monday during a crew equipment integration test. They are mission specialist Andrei Fedyaev of Roscosmos, pilot Warren Woody Hoberg, and Commander Stephen Bowen, who are both from NASA, and mission specialist Sultan al Nayadi from the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in the United Arab Emirates. The mission is scheduled to launch on the 26th of February 2023, so make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss my coverage of this. Laon Aerospace was back in business last week. We set out to create a fully reusable shuttle system in Kerbal Space Program by making use of a special ascent profile and strapping wings and jet engines to the core stage. Lots of twists and turns in this one, I'm really happy with how it came out. So if you've not seen it yet, then check out that card on screen. Also, if you want to see your name on the left there and get early access to these videos and some exclusive content, then check out my Patreon page or channel membership program, links in the description below. But otherwise, thank you everyone so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.